Good evening, everyone. Wonderful to have you with us tonight in the next uh, IOMP webinar series. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, can I please have a couple of housekeeping rules? Uh, you will be all muted uh, for the duration of the webinar. And I will also kindly ask you that you will uh, turn off your videos where possible so that we can um, preserve the bandwidth as much as possible for an un uninterrupted presentation. Also, your questions and answers to our tonight's speakers should be presented to uh, chat. I will be monitoring chat and I will be collecting your questions. And in the, at the end of the session, I will be transferring your questions and asking them on your behalf of our wonderful speaker tonight. I will now share the screen. Uh, I should sort of introduce myself. Many of you already know me. My name is Eva Bizek, and I am the Secretary General of IOMP. And it's a pleasure to be a moderator for tonight's presentation. Can you see my screen, please? Yes. So our distinguished speaker tonight is Dr. John Shakeshaft from Queensland, Australia who will be talking on CTVPTV margins in stereotactic radio surgery. Do we need them? I think this is a really important as well as exciting and intriguing topic. John currently works as the site senior physicist at Gold Coast University Hospital with the Icon Cancer Care Network. He has previously worked with both small and large radiation oncology departments across Australia, and the United Kingdom where he trained. He is also the current chair of the Australasian College of Physical Scientists and Engineers in Medicine Radiation Oncology Specialist Group. Recently, he has also been the trial physicist for the trans Tasman Radiation Oncology Group Cancer Research, Stereotactic Radio Surgery Outrun Trial, and chaired the technical working group developing guidelines for future drug SRS trials. I think SRS has become bread and butter of most larger hospitals. So the question that John is posing in his title is really relevant to many radiation oncology physicists. So without many more words, John, the floor is yours. We are excited to listen to your lecture. Okay, uh, thank you everyone and greetings from uh, what we call a cold evening in Queensland, but it's actually 15 degrees outside, so um, most of you wouldn't regard that as a cold winter evening, I guess. Um, just as we um, start, um, I really have no significant um, conflicts of interest. I do act as an unpaid um, clinical advisor to the Australian Clinical Dissymmetry Service, who I'll talk about a little bit about later. Um, and I'm employed as a medical physicist, but I'm not speaking this evening on behalf of my company. So my views that I express now, if they're controversial, don't blame the company, blame me. Okay, um, the question. Um, do we need CTV to PTV margins when we're performing stereotactic radio surgery? I've talked on this um, a couple of times over the last uh, few years, and it's always led to some animated debate um, because I think there are some very strongly held views um, in both camps. So I thought it would be good to start off and ask people um, what uh, you think. So um, we have a little poll. Um, if you could click on the answer that you think um, is nearest to your, your view. 
And I'm intending to repeat this towards the end of the talk to see whether our views have changed or not. Um, I think uh, most people seem to be, um, oh, a few more coming in. But I, I have to say this is no surprise to me speaking to an audience which, are, which is probably mostly physicists. Margins are our bread and butter. Um, we work in radiation oncology departments and we use um, margins all the time. But there's um, a couple of people in the definitely not um, category. So um, we'll see whether that category uh, changes in size um, by the end of the evening. I'll just uh, share the results with you. So um, I think that's over 50% said um, either yes, definitely, or I think so, but I'm here to check. So um, that's pretty well uh, what I expected um, based on uh, previous um, uh, talks that I've given. So let's let's move on. And I want to, um, uh, I'll just uh, give you a brief outline of what I'm going to say this evening. I'm going to start with a relatively long um, introduction, just reminding us of some of the things that are bread and butter to us, but it's good to um, get our mindset into that space. So some definitions, some differences between conventional um, radiation therapy or radiotherapy and stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about the history of our um, SRS. And then I'm going to run through an example comparing a LINAC uh, with a gamma knife and seeing whether the margins are the same um, based on various factors. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about clinical evidence and finally ICIU 91, and then I'll try and summarize um, what we've covered. So a, a few definitions. Um, I regard stereotactic radiosurgery as a single fraction high dose ablative, ablative radiation therapy. Um, historically, and for the purposes of this webinar, um, it's been limited to cranial lesions. But uh, these days, we may do single fraction um, in other parts of the body. But let's just stick to cranial lesions for tonight. And as I was reviewing my slides a bit earlier, I realized that I really had assumed that we were talking about malignant lesions. Now, that's not necessarily the case with cranial radiosurgery. Um, historically in the past, maybe 50% of lesions have not been malignant, but benign. Um, but I think it's reasonable to at least hold in the back of our mind that it's malignant lesions, i.e. brain metastases, where there has been um, tremendous growth or there is ongoing tremendous uh, growth in demand for radiosurgery. So it's probably where more of us are going to have, it's the space that more of us are going to be in um, either now or in the coming um, years. Now, I just want to remind you um, from ICIU 62, what a CPB to PTP margin is. Um, and it's comprised of the internal margin, which allows for in internal or physiological movement, which is um, typically re respiratory motion, might be cardiac motion, might be other things, um, but is not a big problem when we're talking about cranial lesions. And it's also comprised of the setup margin, which allows for patient setup and um, machine tolerances. So in trying to um, answer my question, we need to consider um, setup errors in the position of our patient. We need to consider potentially contouring uncertainty. And we need to consider the um, equipment performance 
of the equipment that we're going to use to um, treat our patient. Now, I think most people would um, agree that all those things are greater than zero millimeters in size. And so therefore, following ICIU 62, our setup margin is greater than zero millimeters in size. And therefore, our CTB to PTB margin is greater than, it says zero meters, but um, it's greater than zero millimeters in size. And so therefore, um, this is the shortest IOMG webinar ever because I've answered my question in the first few slides. Well, it's not quite that simple. Or I think at least there are other things to think about and debate. And just before we move on and think about those, um, I'd like us just to remind you of the effect of a margin when we're treating something very small. So if we've got a, being physicists, everything's a, a perfect and regular shape. So if we've got a lesion that's a 10 millimeter diameter sphere, um, then its volume is around half a cc. If we add a one millimeter margin to that, it becomes a 12 millimeter diameter sphere and its volume becomes 0.9 cc. So just by adding a one millimeter margin, we have increased the volume that we're treating by 73%. If we um, decide that our uncertainties are even bigger and we add a two millimeter margin, then that increases the volume to 1.4 cc. And so we have now multiplied the volume that we're treating by over two and a half. Um, so that's, that tells you that margins are clinically very significant in SRS because we're going to be treating, if we start adding margins, even quite small ones, we're going to end up treating a, a much larger volume of the brain. And so we need to bear that in mind too. Now, let's just remind ourselves about conventional radiotherapy. If you do conventional radiotherapy, you're probably going to treat your patients on something that looks a little like one of these two things, or maybe um, one of these two things. What we do is we take multimodality imaging and we construct a CTV, that's the red circle. We add a margin for known geometric uncertainties and we create a PTV. And those, as we just said, come from motion during treatment, random errors, systematic errors. And typically, machine geometric uncertainties are much less than the CTV to PTV margin that we end up with. We treat the lesion with a uniform dose, and we aim to cover the PTV with greater than around 95% of the prescription dose and less than 107% of the prescription dose. And um, Eva can talk more about this afterwards because it's her area of expertise, but um, the radiobiology is fairly well understood. And then when we're treating the patient, we take a verification image and we ensure that the tumor is within the PTV. And if the CTV to PTV margins that we use are too small, we lose control. Um, and that's clearly seen in some patients. Now, if we were to go down to our um, SRS treatment showroom, um, we'd end up and we'd see a few other things. Um, we might see a, a gamma knife um, or a gamma knife. This is the latest gamma knife icon, um, which has um, imaging and can treat using um, a thermoplastic frame. We might see a cyber knife. We might see um, a conventional LINAC. We might see uh, a conventional LINAC with a few extra bells and whistles. We might get um, cones for our LINAC. We might use um, extra patient verification systems such as um, surface guided uh, radiotherapy. And if you want the latest toy, you might even um, see a, a ZAPEX. And as we do our um, SRS, again, we do multimodality imaging to create a CTV, um, often a GTV. Um, 
And we need to optimize that um, for distortions and voxel size, because now we're talking about very small things so um, and great accuracy. So if you've got distortions in your imaging, that's going to have an effect on the accuracy of your treatment. Um, if you use voxels in your imaging that are too big, then you might miss what you're trying to treat altogether. Well, now do we add an art margin for uh, known geometric uncertainty to um, give us a PTV? Well, there are, as we've already discussed, some known geometric uncertainties. Um, we've got different types of patient immobilization. We might use um, a minimally invasive frame, or we might use a thermoplastic mask. Um, we're treating with one fraction, so all our errors become systematic. They're there for every, um, the entire treatment. And the machine geometric uncertainties um, become equivalent or greater than the required CTV to PTV margin. If our required CTV to PTV margin is zero, then our machine uncertainties are definitely bigger. May not be a lot bigger, but they're definitely bigger. And we treat with those distributions that vary with the technology. And the way we prescribe usually is a covering um, isodose. Uh, the radiobiology is less well understood. And we might um, take a verification image to check our patients in the right position. We might not. We might rely on the immobilization, particularly if we're using a, a frame. So what I'm trying to say here is SRS is just not a simple adaptation of radiation therapy. And it's actually not a simple adaptation of um, neurosurgery either. Um, and I, I, I want you to go away with a changed mindset if you don't have it already, that what we're doing here is not just um, another version of radiotherapy. So let's um, historically think about what we're trying to do with stereotactic radiosurgery. We're trying to make sure that the radiation dose, which does the work, ablates the tumor, hits the usually small target precisely and accurately. And where has our data for being able to do this come from? Well, historically, most of it has come from the gamma knife. Um, this paper is perhaps a little bit old now, um, five years old. But, uh, and it reports the increase of using LINAC to the radio surgery. But back in 2003, only 3% of um, radio surgery was done on a LINAC. By 2011, um, that had risen to 30%. I suspect that's risen more now, but it's important to realize that a lot of the evidence has come from the gamma knife. Now, gamma knife users, um, are often based in neurosurgical departments, not um, radiation oncology or radiotherapy departments. They probably, unlike um, us physicists, um, don't regard um, the ICIU reports um, as their Bible and have typically used zero millimeter to CTV to PTV margins, or at least in RO stick. Um, Historically, the gamma knife until recently hasn't performed any on treatment imaging. And they have achieved excellent clinical results. So, what if we benchmark what we're going to do now with other equipment that's not a gamma knife um, against that gamma knife process and adopt our attitude to margin and other things accordingly? So the traditional gamma knife process, um, the patient is fitted with a so-called minimally abrasive frame, it's a, a, a stereotactic frame that's um, screwed to the skull for rigidity. We then acquire um, planning images, um, MRI with or without CT, um, and the images are required with the patient in the frame and a fiducial box. And this fiducial box, which has um, uh, marks that are visible on the images, um, allows us to define a coordinate system in our planning system 
It also allows us to confirm the geometry um, and integrity of the images, which can be important if you've got a, a slightly poorer MRI scanner. Um, and then the machine is set up using the coordinate system relative to the frame. Um, we then go to our planning system and on the gamma knife, we generate a plan. And on the, the later gamma knives, that consisted of um, shots from different collimator sizes. Um, and that's how we treat the patient or that's the plan for treating the patient. We then attach the patient to the machine and use the coordinate systems um, from the planning system to set up our patient so that the lesions that we're trying to treat end up at the isocenter of the machine. And multiple publications suggest that the geometric accuracy of this is somewhere in the region of 0.2 to 0.25 millimeters. Um, the manufacturer actually um, has a tolerance of 0.3 millimeters. So that's pretty impressive. Um, there are um, potential uncertainties from geometric distortion on the MRI, and that's scan dependent, but by using the fiducial box, we can actually keep an eye on those and quantify those. Um, and so probably the overall geome geometric uncertainty is of around half a millimeter or less, which is pretty impressive. That's like one or less than one voxel, depending on which particular image you're looking at. And that gives us um, a certain dosimetric uncertainty at the edge of the lesion. Um, and this is just um, on the right here. Um, these are just um, profiles. Um, from the different uh, shot sizes that you can um, give on the gamma knife. And so if we've got a geometric uncertainty of half a millimeter at the edge of the lesion, um, then that gives us a certain dosimetric uncertainty. Um, if we're offset by half a millimeter, and that's typically of the order of five to 10%. So that geometric uncertainty gives us a dosimetric uncertainty um, of five to 10% at the edge of the lesion. So historical treatments are actually quite different to what we do on a contemporary LINAC. The treatment machine is very different. It's built um, generally to a higher specification of geometric accuracy. Um, the patient immobilization um, is different. Um, we use a stereotactic frame, whereas on a contemporary LINAC, um, we use a thermoplastic mask. And so our uncertainties are going to be different. So let's try um, and benchmark uh, CR LINAC against our gamma knife. Because to use equivalent or zero margins like has been done on the gamma knife, where our clinical data comes from, we're going to need to meet the gamma knife dosimetric and geometric, or the dosimetric performance, because that's it's the dose that actually um, treats the patient. So what we're aiming for is five to ten percent dosimetric uncertainty at the edge of the lesion. Um, and the required geometrical performance of our LINAC is going to depend on the shape of the dose distribution we use. Now, I haven't considered organs at risk here, um, and just keep in mind that everything is still single fraction, so all our errors are systematic. So let's go through um, some of the things that contribute um, to our geometrical uncertainty. We, um, if we're using MR for planning, um, which we probably will, um, there may be a distortion in those uh, images. Now, when we um, have our fiducial box on the gamma knife, we probably, um, well, the gamma knife software, the planning software, will tell you the uncertainty um, in the location of the fiducial 
are marks. In our radiotherapy planning system, you may not have the equivalent. Um, and so we need to be aware of what it might be. And there are a, a, a number of publications out there. Um, and uh, this particular one <coughs> reports a median displacement of the G GTP res um, resulting from gradient distortion on the gradient cores of the gamma knife um, was 1.2 millimeters with really quite a big range. Um, another paper uh, reported uh, mean absolutes from distortion on the, <coughs> the frequency encoding direction was about um, 0.3 millimeters. So what I've said is that if we're careful, um, our MR distortion may contribute um, 0.35 millimeters. This is common to the gamma knife, but the assessment may be different. When um, treating on a LINAC, we have a CP to, um, sorry, uh, just to have a sip of water. Um, a CT to MR registration error, which we don't have on the gamma knife. Um, and we need the CT on our um, LINAC because we're going to use that for positioning our patient. We potentially have clinician contouring errors. I've excluded those because they're, they are very important, but they're common to all processes. Um, and we may have uncertainties in use from contrast used in imaging. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the very end. On our LINAC, um, our MLC, which we're probably going to use these days, um, is not perfectly calibrated. Um, so it may give um, a field of the wrong size slightly or at the wrong position. Um, the LINAC is not as solid as the gamma knife. And so there is a finite radiation isocenter size. Now it's actually quite difficult to quantify the effect of those two things on the dosimetry of the patient, because typically these days we treat um, using arcs and some of that averages out over the arc. Um, but just looking at um, some specifications of um, a LINAC that uh, we might buy. The um, this is specifications that the manufacturer guarantees. Um, gantry and collimator isocenter accuracy less than half a millimeter radius. Gantry and collimator and couch isocenter accuracy less than or equal to 0.75 millimeters radius. MLC, um, leaf end accuracy um, plus or minus one millimeter. Those, are, those numbers are beginning to sound quite big compared to the overall geometric accuracy on the gamma knife that we saw of um, half, um, half a millimeter. And if we go to the, um, this is on a, a very intrusive, and those of you who've got one will know that it um, has a performance check that it does on itself every day. Um, and we find that those specification numbers are seen in the, the tolerances that it uses for that um, performance check. And even if we go to the um, enhanced MLC check, uh, which uses an imager that's closer to the source, and so there's less blurring on the penumbra, so it's potentially more accurate. Those uh, default tolerances are still a millimeter. Um, and this is just to um, illustrate um, that this is potentially a real problem. These uh, come from a number of Linux in our own organization. Um, which all passed that uh, standard morning QA. And the way these images were taken um, is we irradiated two quadrant fields, rotated the collimator, irradiated the other two quadrant fields, 
Um, and if your MLC is perfectly aligned, um, then you'll get something pretty much like you see here um, in the top left. But you can see not all Linux were quite that good. Um, and so we're going to have to work harder um, with our Linux and we're going to have to push it um, beyond what the manufacturer says that you can. But I, I, I think probably um, about half a millimeter is definitely achievable. But that is still tighter than the Linux manufacturer's specification. There are some other things. There's the, we're going to use um, KV imaging to um, align our patient. And if the, um, that tells you, what that tells you is not exactly where the MV treatment beam is, then that introduces another error. Um, and based on this publication, uh, based on various publications, I've said that we can get that down to maybe 0.2 millimeters if we're careful. Um, we will have some uncertainty in doing the image match um, between, in order to set up the patient. Um, we'll have um, an uncertainty to do with rotating the table. I've excluded that because I said it can be removed by imaging and effectively comes down to this um, uh, KV to MV isocenter um, uncertainty. And then we move our patient and there's probably a small uncertainty um, in the position of the couch following that move. Oh yeah, and um, there's this paper here that if you if you read it carefully, you'll see that they estimate um, that the uncertainty in these two put together is somewhere around the order of 0.4 millimeters. So we've got you know half a millimeter in our MLC, we've got 0.4 millimeter here, we've got um, fractions of a millimeter um, here and there. And then I'm not going to talk about this anymore tonight, but if we're going to um, treat lesions off axis, then we've got the potential effect of um, rotations as well. And so this is the treating a multiple brain metastases um, with a single isocenter scenario. Um, and as you move further away from the isocenter, small rotational errors are going to magnify um, the uncertainty in what a position of where the, the dose goes. So what do we do about all this? I've um, suggested some numbers of uncertainty, but they're all quite variable depending on what system you use, which paper you read. Um, so I would suggest that you need to, and it's essential that, you determine the performance of your own system or systems. And that actually can be quite hard to do well. Um, and then uh, you get an independent audit, if you can, to make sure that um, the uncertainties that you think you have got are consistent with the audit. And I'm just going to plug this um, publication from the uh, AAPM and Radio Surgery Society. And one of the things they recommend is that you should be doing a full end-to-end -end test at least once a year. I might say um, a little bit more often than that if you're trying to push your margin sizes um, to as small as you can. Now, um, in Australia and New Zealand, we are lucky to have the Australian Clinical Decimetry Service. They'll come and they will do an on-site um, SRS audit, so they actually come to you. It's not a postal audit um, like you might get from IROC. They have um, an anthropomorphic phantom and they have three cases that they ask you to plan um, and they slowly get uh, more difficult. Um, the first one is a, a single um, metastasis. The second one is multiple metastases and they actually ask you to, it's a hidden target test. So they actually ask you to MRI the phantom and from the MRI, 
um, you determine where the targets are. Um, and then when they come and measure, they check that you have irradiated in the right place. So that will um, pick up potentially any issues with your uh, MRI scanning. And then they have a, a very complex multiple metastasis case um, where there are, um, you're asked for different prescriptions for different uh, uh, of the lesions. And um, this is kind of hot off the press data. Um, and this audit is still in development, it's still in field trials. Um, but these are the uncertainties um, in position that they picked up from their first um, batch of audits. So um, you'll see that um, in the simple case, actually has the worst result in it somewhat surprisingly. But we're, we're seeing geometrical uncertainties typically um, under a millimeter, but there are a few just over the millimeter. I'm actually pretty impressed with these results um, and um, they're actually better than I thought they might be. They represent results from a, a range of equipment. So um, Linux, Gamonite, Cybernite. Um, so, but generally we, we're doing a millimeter or better. However, that doesn't take into account um, immobilization. The patient um, may move during the treatment. Um, and you can search the literature. This is one paper that I found that suggested that maybe using the frame on the gamma knife is a little bit better than using the thermoplastic mask. This was a full rigid thermoplastic mask, not an open mask um, like might be used with um, uh, SGRT. Um, this is another recent paper out of uh, Peter Mack in Melbourne. Um, and they saw uh, interfraction, intrafraction motion of, if you look at these numbers here, of around um, a millimeter or up to a millimeter with some uh, rotational errors of um, up to 0.5, 0 0.7 of a degree. These are slightly larger than that um, previous paper. So it is something we need to be mindful of um, that all things are not equal and you need to do it yourself. There's a lot of work in generating this data. Um, and I'll keep saying this because it's one of my hobby horses, but note that rotations really are critical for off-axis lesions. So what sort of overall accuracy can we get from our linac based radio surgery system? Um, in this paper, uh, they compared CTV to PTV margins required if the patient was imaged and repositioned at different um, couch angles. They used exact track to do this and came up with 0.8 millimeters. Um, if the patient was only imaged at the start of treatment, then they got 1.9 millimeters. So the conclusion was we do need to image at different couch angles. Um, another group uh, in Melbourne um, concluded that the overall spatial accuracy for their SRI system was around 1.35 millimeters. That's kind of on, um, maybe the slightly larger side. Um, remember that the previous paper concluded 0.8 millimeters. Um, with the ACDS without intrafraction motion included, um, we were seeing less than a millimeter or just less than a millimeter. Um, I'm not going to make much comment on this, but there's been um, talk recently about whether you could use surface guided radiotherapy um, to improve that intrafraction motion. Um, and there's some emerging evidence that actually there is scope to do that. So um, potentially the errors here are quite small.
Finally, we've got the um, effects of the dose distribution and the prescription. Now, if you use a gamma knife, as I showed earlier, um, you tend to end up with a fairly peaky dose distribution across the target. On the gamma knife, people tend to prescribe to around the 50% um, of the peak, which gives you the steepest fall off. Um, so the dose fall off may be up to 15% per millimeter. If you use a, a LINAC um, and use a strict dynamic conformal arc approach, then you end up with a flatter distribution. Um, you may prescribe to a higher isodose and the dose fall off at the edge of the metastasis um, might be less. Um, so in, in this case, around 8% per millimeter. So if that's the case, and these are the two systems that we are comparing, then small geometrical errors may have less dosimetric effect um, with the dynamic conformal arc. So you may get away with slightly smaller margins um, on your LINAC. Is there any clinical evidence um, that margins are important? Um, there are papers out there. Um, this was the results, um, the final report from RTOG 1905. Um, I don't conclude a lot from this. It says, those patients treated on a linear accelerator um, had a 2.84 greater risk of local progression. Of note, however, 61% of the gamma knife treated patients have recurrent primary brain tumors compared to 30% of patients treated on a linear accelerator. So there was some heterogeneity there. So I think it's difficult to draw too many conclusions. Um, this is another study. Um, and they concluded what they did was they um, treated some patients with uh, no margin, some patients with one millimeter margin, and some patients with a two millimeter margin. And they concluded that there was no increase in local control or survival by adding a margin, but significant um, increase in complications. And you'll find there are quite a lot of um, other papers out there that conclude that if you add a margin, you increase the risk of complications. Now, I don't think most of us would say you need to do a clinical study prove that if you radiate more, then you're going to have a greater risk of something um, going wrong. Um, and I'm talking in very general terms there. But they say there was no increase in local control by adding a margin. So does that mean we shouldn't use margins? Some might say so. Um, I think I would probably say it means that we need to look a little more carefully at the dose prescription. And it may be that the, even if there was a small geometrical error um, in some of the patients with no margin, the dose that the tumors were covered with was still sufficient um, to have a therapeutic effect. So my own view is the evidence is quite thin um, clinically as to whether um, we should or shouldn't use uh, margins. Well, I probably should have started here, but I'm going to almost end here. Um, there is a, an official answer, and there are lots of words here. Um, and this comes from one of the later um, ICRU reports. And it says, in cranial radiosurgery, especially when dedicated devices are used, the total geometric uncertainties are usually quite small. In end-to-end -end testing, like the um, ACDS audit, these can be less than a millimeter. In these cases, it's not uncommon for patients to be treated without any expansion from CTV to PTV, or for that matter, any expansion from GTV to PTV. As with CTV, there may be rational reasons uh, for which a 0.5 to one millimeter uncertainty is ignored in the planning process. However, even if the dose will be prescribed directly to the GTV, it is recommended to evaluate and report the dose to a PTV.
it is then possible to compare and evaluate clinical studies. So what they're saying is, if your geometrical uncertainty is very small, then it may be reasonable not to add a CTV to PTV margin. Um, but you should report the dose to a PTV knowing what your um, geometrical uncertainty is. Now, I think that's a little bit of a fudge, but um, that's the official answer. So in summary, um, although the questions sound simple, um, it's actually quite complicated. Um, and I would say we need to consider the geometric performance of our own treatment system very carefully. Um, if we're going to use that system with a tighter tolerance than the manufacturer specification, we need to consider the risks associated with that and whether you're going to be able to maintain that. Um, we need to carefully consider the immobilization performance of the um, immobilization system we're using. And there may be an operator learning curve um, in that, both for frames and masks. Um, we need to consider how mid-treatment imaging might reduce those uncertainties. Um, could continuous surface-guided imaging reduce uncertainties further? I think the um, jury is still out on that one. It may be that the open mask that's required increases um, movement and so increases the uncertainties. And we need to do um, a, a risk benefit analysis. I mean, obviously adding unnecessary margins will add significant extra morbidity, but failing to add necessary margins may reduce the chance of a good outcome. And one of the reasons that I've um, been thinking about this recently, um, as implied in uh, Eva's introduction, is when we're doing a clinical trial, we need to compare apples with apples even though the, the treatment systems that are being used are heterogeneous and in some cases very different. And that's actually incredible, incredibly difficult. And finally, just because I like saying this as much as I can, don't forget rotations if you're treating off axis. Um, I've talked mostly about single lesions at the isocenter. Um, but an off axis lesion adds complexity and rotations will become significant. So a 0.1 degree rotation will add around 0.1 millimeter uncertainty at 50 millimeters from the isocenter. You may be able to detect the um, rotation in patients, um, but your imaging may be less sensitive to rotation. But imaging probably won't detect an error in your linac collimator rotation, which is also important. So when we move from a single isocenter for lesion to a single isocenter for multi-brain met, um, multi met treatments, we may need to reconsider our margins. So I hope I've given you something to think about. Um, Uh, okay, so um, I've got another poll to see whether our views have changed um, during the last 30, 45 minutes. I think we've got a few more people joined. Yes. Well, I think we do see a shift because in the previous yeah. poll, yes, definitely. 
And yes, I think so were more dominant dancers. And now I think we have more people talking about that this depends on the clinical scenario or whether the target is away from the ISO center. Okay, so if I go, there we go. It, um, so now it depends on the clinical scenario wins and actually wins fairly hands down. Yes. Although there's still a significant cohort that think we definitely or probably need margins. Yes. Excellent. Now, um, that was kind of the original end of the talk. Um, but I've just got a couple more slides. Um, just to emphasize that it's actually important to step back and look at your whole process. Um, when we got our, our gamma knife in Brisbane, um, where I used to work, we had advice from more than one gamma knife center that said, when you do your planning MRI scan, increase the amount of contrast that you would give um, over a standard diagnostic scan. Um, and this is in the context of brain metastases, because you will see more lesions, um, because if you only use the standard amount of contrast, Partial volume effects may mean that you miss some of the really small ones. However, if you do that, it probably makes other um, lesions that you can see look larger. So that inherently adds a margin. Um, so if you change something like the amount of contrast that you add, it may add some uncertainty or another factor to your whole process. So you really do need to think about each step in the process. And another question for you, you do need to think about how your planning system handles margins. Um, if they're less than one voxel in size, um, some systems handle that um, better than others. So I hope you're not scratching your head too much, um, but I'd just like to say thank you to the IOMP for inviting me. Um, thank you to the ACDS for their audit results. And um, thank you for the TROG SRS Technical Working Group for many um, thought-provoking discussions. Okay, wonderful. And, um, I know we're running out of time, but um, I thought I'd just end with my own view that um, I probably fall into the category that um, it depends on the clinical scenario. Um, and a final quote, um, I kind of feel that I'm trying to believe, uh, what is it, six impossible things before breakfast. So that I want, to, I want to believe that the answer to my question is both yes and no at the same time. So thank you for your attention, everyone. Thank you, John. John, you are not off the hook yet because I have to ask you questions. Uh, I'll do my how do you calculate setup margin for a single fraction treatment? Would you still use Marcel van Herck's formula that considers systematic and random errors, while in this case, you, every error will be just systematic error? Um, no, you don't. Um, I would, that different people use different approaches. Um, in an earlier version of this talk, I just, um, and I have done this, I used the root mean square of all my uncertainties. Um, but there are other approaches, and if you go to the literature, you'll find other, um, other approaches for doing this, but you don't use um, Van Herk because it's not designed for um, single fraction. single fraction. Okay, thank you. Um, you have discussed later on the MRI CT fusion. Do you think that 0.3 millimeter uncertainty is sufficient? someone would suggest that it could be up to one millimeter. And, and there was certainly, um, that will be the case. Um, it depends on lots of factors. Um, I mean, it depends to some extent uh, on whether you're trying to treat multiple metastases and use the whole um, field of view of the MRI scanner. Um, it depends on whether you've got um, good uh, anatomy near where you're trying to uh, do your registration um, that you can see on both CT and MR. So it 
it could be greater than that. I just, that was one value that I um, found in the literature. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fact that you're using a whole 3D data set means that it ends up being a little bit less than you think it is, um, if the distortion is relatively low. John, will you be able to comment on using triple F beams for SRS? Um, I, I can say yes, we do. <laughs> um, so where does it come into this discussion? You will have again sharper penumbra? You, you potentially sharper have a sharper dog. penumbra. You, you do um, potentially have to modulate more though. So um, that may add to some uncertainties. Um, in one of the departments where I now work, we have the Varian Hyperarch system and we do use the triple F beam for treating there. And we generally haven't found it's a problem. Um, on some Linux, um, I, I showed the Varian um, NPC. On some Linux, you may find that the beam axis of the triple F beam uh, is not in exactly the same position as your flattened beam, depending on the beam steering. Um, and so we're getting a little bit off CTV to PPV margins, but I would say that you need to do the Winston Lutz test or whatever your test is with the beam that you're going to use to treat. I think basically what you're saying that things can uh, change between departments, Linux, different beams, and therefore people have to do their end-to-end -to -end, end -end testing to identify what their margins are for their own facility and the equipment. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's hard. Yes, yeah. If the departments or countries do not have access to a company like ACDS in Australia, who could do independent audit for them? Um, IROC out of um, the US will do an independent audit, but their SRS audit is actually only a single lesion, um, which is part, it's much more well established than the ACDS one, um, but it is only a single lesion, so you have to adapt it if you want to try and test something that's off axis. Yeah. Would you consider five targets too complex for a Linux? Um, no. No. In a simple <laughs> word, I, I, I think we're, we've treated certainly over 15. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. There is a comment in the chat that IAEA can also do independent audits for SRS. Okay, uh, you commented on the couch rotations. There was a comment during your talk, but I think you addressed it a bit later that couch rotations most definitely introduce additional errors. And maybe for some couch positions like 90 degrees, you may not even be able to do imaging. Um, that is the case. Um, a lot of people um, do have the exact track system and depending on the position of the gantry, you can do imaging um, with the couch yes. Um I have no personal experience, but some of the um, SGRT systems are, that are designed for SRS, um, allow you to image your patient at the couch 90 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, with the, depending again, how the departments work, would you have to consider anatomy changes between the simulation and the treatment? Or are we assuming that the brain lesions would not change or anatomy will not change that much? Um, I didn't mention that one. Um, brain metastases can grow and they can grow quite quickly. quickly. Um, I, uh, when I'm doing, where I've been doing um, SRS treatments, um, we've been used to doing the imaging all on the day of treatment. Um, yeah. and so it grows. That was my experience as well. So you do it uh, on the same day. So, certainly, if you're using a um, minimally invasive brain, you have to because you, don't, you, you can't take the frame on and off. Um, for um, our fractionated treatments, then we do limit the amount of time between MRI scan and treatment. Um, and if it's too long, then we'll add a margin to allow for potential growth. Exactly. Um, 
So once again, depends on the overall scenario, what people will do in terms of adding margins or not. Yeah. Uh, there is a comment here. So the dose gradient is the reason for not using PTV in Gamma Knife as compared to with Linux based SRS? Ah, uh, no. Um, it's the other way around, maybe. It's the other way around, yes. Yeah. Uh, the Gamma Knife you typically uh, prescribe to the steepest part of the dose gradient. So that actually makes geometric uncertainties uh, potentially more important um, at the edge of the lesion. If you've got a slightly shallower dose gradient, which um, you may do, depending on your optimizer, then that may give you a little bit more wiggle room. Um, I'll just add here that <coughs> HyperArt, which is Varian's system, is designed to mimic the gamma knife dose distribution. So again, you need to think about what planning system you're using and what dose distribution it's giving you. Mm -hmm. Uh, what would be your approach for a two millimeter mega voltage isocenter size? Um, I'd, I'd first ask where that came from. Um, if that included the couch, then there may be ways of either imaging or using other ways to take out the couch isocenter rotation. If that comes from the Linux alone, um, I probably wouldn't be doing SRS on that machine if the manufacturer said, or your service department said that they couldn't make that tighter. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one question is, why do you not take into account MRI resolution in gamma knife uh, uncertainties? Um, is that the, the one millimeter voxel size that we're mm -hmm. talking about. It is another uncertainty and it actually comes into play in the, the last comment about um, uh, um, contrast um, and whether you're getting partial volume effects. Um, it's another uncertainty and it, but it's common to all systems as well. Yes, yeah. Now, if a department wants to do an SRS audit, is there a protocol documentation that they can follow how to do end-to-end -end audit that you would recommend to follow? Um, Where can they find it? An end-to-end -end audit should follow your clinical process. So, um, Typically, you do want to use an anthropomorphic phantom because it's very difficult to um, follow your clinical process, including image matching, if you don't have something that looks like what you're going to treat on the day. Um, there are a number of phantoms out there that are designed for SRS. Um, so I, I would say, actually, it's not. you just take the phantom through the process that you have designed for your patients. Patient, and yeah. if that, um, that won't be the same in each department. Yes. John, would you say, uh, considering uh, the results of some of those clinical trials, that the CTV uncertainty is possibly a bigger issue than a PTV margin? Um, Especially for something like glioblastoma multiform, uh, the disagreement in the literature where the CTV is, whether it's one centimeter or two centimeter to edemas, there is not even an agreement on that. And yet even 15% of uh, uh, carcinogenic cells can be found even outside the larger CTV margin. Um. I can use the cop out answer, I'm not a doctor. Um, <laughs> and it's, I, it's certainly true there are disagreements. If you were treating something very large, then you probably wouldn't be doing um, SRS. Um, and if you've got that much microscopic disease spread, you probably wouldn't be doing SRS. No SRS either, yeah. Now, uh, Okay, what gamma criteria do you use for plan verification? I'll just finish with the last questions because we are going over time. 
Um, we, 20 years, we film 3% one millimeter, greater than 95%. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So 3% one millimeter. So John, thank you very much for a thought provoking talk and the discussion it has entailed. Uh, just a reminder for everyone that the presentation is being recorded as well as the discussion. So you can revisit the presentation at your own time. Usually the recording is uploaded within the 24 hours of the of the talk so sometimes tomorrow we had nearly 500 participants so uh that was a great participation and i hope you have found the talk uh same as myself uh, very interesting and useful thank you john and all the best everyone uh thank you everyone and uh for those of you who were still morning have a great day yeah. All the best. Bye. Bye.